Good morning, good afternoon. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Areas Center, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to our monthly uh, MPA webinar series with Open Channels and EBM Tools. Actually, this, this month is a bonus. We've actually had more than one this month. Uh, but today's is, uh, I'm particularly looking forward to because it's about facilitating collaborative public decisions, uh, a video-based training tool. And I, I think one of the things that we've found in the work at the, at the MPA Center and with MPA programs is that they are collaborative decisions and that people can always benefit from learning about experiences that other programs have had. And what we're going to hear about today is uh, a tool that's been developed based on a, a lot of video material to demonstrate what kinds of interactions have, have uh, taken place and what kinds of lessons have been learned through um, examples of public decision making. Uh, as, as you all know, uh, we are going to have a presentation by Stephen Yaffe. I'll introduce him in a moment. And we really welcome your questions and comments. So we hope that you will use the question box on the webinar interface to submit your questions. And I'll be facilitating that Q&A session at the end of uh, of Steve's talk. And so please please feel free to, to chime in and, and ask your questions. So um, now I'm going to go ahead and introduce Steve, uh, who is the Professor of Natural Resources and Environmental Policy at the University of Michigan. And, uh, I had the good fortune to be his student a few years ago. Uh, he has worked for more than 40 years on federal endangered species, public lands, and ecosystem management policy, and is the author or co-author of five books. Uh, he grew up in Washington, D.C. and spent his youth hearing stories about public policy and politics while experiencing firsthand the loss of native habitat associated with urban sprawl. And that led to an interest in improving the process of decision making so that more environmentally sound decisions can be made. And he has facilitated many collaborative processes across North America and also assisted a set of philanthropic foundations with ways to develop evaluation metrics for their conservation programs. And he is currently working on a new book detailing the history and lessons of the California Marine Protected Areas designation process. So very happy to have you with us, Steve, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Lauren. And, and as you said, you were a student of ours, and I, we take uh, credit for everything good you've done and no liability for, for anything else, if there's anything else. As it should be. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, as Lauren said, I'm going to be describing a new uh, web-based tool that explores the process of collaborative decision-making, and it, it does use video clips from California's process for designing a network of marine protected areas. Um, but before I talk about the tool, I want to briefly describe uh, sort of why we developed it, our motivation for developing it, and I'll talk a little bit about the California MPA process, not knowing who, who's out there and listening. And I'll also give a very quick intro to collaborative decision making, uh, though I'm sure many on the webinar are familiar with the concept and, uh, and terms. So on motivation, yeah, I don't know if you noticed, but there was a, an election this week um, and a fairly long, uh, fairly nasty campaign over the past year. Uh, if you take that and sort of the inability of Congress and other institutions to craft effective decisions, I think they are indicators of how polarized a society we've become. Uh, and it sure seemed like we uh, spent a, a year where people were talking past each other uh, with conversations often focusing on personality over substance. And it was a year that really, that really begged for better interaction and, and engagement in the real problems facing the country and the world, but the process was not successful at fostering it. Um, and some of the same maladies are true in the area of natural resources and environmental management. Uh, conflict, uh, decisions that don't reflect an adequate understanding of real world conditions um, often characterize planning and decision making and, and can lead to impasse. And to get beyond this, we do need better, more collaborative, more effective decision making processes. And this is particularly true when working at a landscape or a seascape scale. And to accomplish this, we need people who are capable of facilitating these processes, um, along with stakeholder representatives who have a clearer, uh, better understanding of what the processes are about. And ultimately, to help develop these skills and perspectives, we need more active, more transformative teaching tools. So that's sort of our overall motive. Let me go a little bit further on this. My own frame of reference on this comes from uh, more than 20 years of work on ecosystem-based management, 
in the terrestrial, freshwater, and marine worlds. And as a side note, um, Julia Wandelek and I have a new book coming out uh, in uh, about a month or so from Island Press that describes some of the, the work in the marine realm. So to work at a landscape or seascape, an ecosystem scale, you need to involve multiple individuals and organizations who have knowledge and an understanding of the many interests affected by management. So ecosystem-based management requires collaborative decision-making. And my sort of one-minute summary of collaborative decision-making is that it is a process that brings together stakeholders and others uh, who have an interest in an issue or a place. Um, it usually involves them in face-to-face -face dialogue and, and often consensus-seeking decision-making. Uh, it needs to incorporate relevant applied science and other information in what we would generally call a shared learning process. And it needs to incorporate effective sideboards that come from its legal and institutional context, which is particularly true because agencies are often the conveners of these processes. So, Fundamentally, collaborative decision-making is a process that can produce outcomes, number one, and can produce outcomes that include so-called win-win possibilities. Um, that is, if we imagine that a decision will provide benefits to two opposing stakeholders, traditional decision-making processes generally look like the first line here, the red line. Uh, lots of competition for a fixed set of benefits, uh, zero-sum situation. So that the, the best both usually get is a compromise between their positions. Collaboration, on the other hand, can in, in fact expand what's on the table and prompt the creativity needed for effective settlement. In this case, that means shifting the line up and to the right so that both parties do better. And these are the joint gains, the sort of mythical win-win type possibilities. But everything that I know from many years of researching these processes and facilitating numerous ones across North America is that collaborative decision making is tough. It faces uh, a host of challenges, uh, and you all I'm sure have a, a list of them. Uh, some of mine are usually you face sort of a zero sum mentality that leads individuals and groups into being intransigent and less willing to think creatively. Uh, it's often difficult to create an environment where you get some sort of shared learning going on, a shared understanding uh, that produces really a rich, deep understanding of problems and solutions. The roles of facilitators and stakeholders are often misunderstood or poorly carried out, and you've got a range of personalities, some of whom can be difficult, that make managing such efforts challenging. So there are many roadblocks to successful agreements. So in order to achieve joint gains um, in order to craft effective and durable agreements so that we in fact do solve critical problems. We need well-designed and well-run processes. We need capable people who can act as facilitators and mediators who design and run processes. And we need stakeholders and policymakers who better understand the potential and dynamics of collaborative processes. But to achieve these things, I think, requires a shift in teaching approaches. Um, and I have taught professional track master students and mid-career audiences negotiation and mediation skills for, I don't know, three decades or so. But I started it when I was 10 years old. Um, and while we do our, whoops, let's see here. There we go. Um, while we do our best, Often the teaching approach is, approach is to use case studies and case presenters to tell stories about effective process. And, and the challenge that these post hoc reflections uh, present is they often lack detail of what specifically was done because people don't remember post hoc. And it's really often hard for students to put themselves into the mindset of the facilitator. The other teaching tool that we use are role play simulations, which simulate reality, but they're not reality. And a trainer is dependent on students or participants to exhibit behaviors that then we either laud or we critique. And the simulated experience rarely comes up to best practice levels. So all of this backdrop set up for us a design challenge. And that is, um, could we create a tool 
that could foster an understanding of the real dynamics of collaborative problem solving. And in doing so, uh, create opportunities for students um, and for professionals to acquire facilitation or mediation skills, or to at least expand their set, their toolkit. We wanted to create something that could be used by individuals themselves, or it could be used in a teaching environment that involves uh, multiple participants. And we wanted to create something that could adapt to different levels of need. That is, that it would provide multiple pathways through the material. And to do this, we needed a case that would provide examples of real-world facilitators running a complex process so that the users can see them grapple with many of the challenges that occur. Um, so th they would see best practices, but with their warts and all. Um, and we needed to array these examples in some sort of logical structure that provides a framework for thinking about the process of collaborative problem solving. So we had a framework that we use in, in training that seems to work to describe the structure of the process. It provides a rough sort of four-part framework that involves first uh, getting a process underway, um, secondly sort of building a rich understanding of issues, interests, and options, then in facilitating evaluation of those options um, while helping the parties to create packages of solutions, and finally uh, securing commitments and agreements. And the diagram here is really meant to suggest that as you move from the left towards the right, the amount of information, the amount of interest on the table tends to expand until the third stage where the goal is then to start to narrow down in order to craft and secure agreements. One of our students started calling this the armadillo model, not because stakeholders sometimes curl into a ball in the corners of meetings rooms, which they do, uh, but in his view, it, it sort of looked like an armadillo. There's something like this, um, or, you know, perhaps this helps. In any case, we, we had a working framework, and then what we needed was a case study with access to video recordings of the real process. So enter the California Marine Life Protection Act initiative, which uh, uh, was a multi-year process aimed at designating marine protected areas in California state waters. It ultimately succeeded in designating 16% as protected areas. And because they had the great benefit of roughly $30 million in private philanthropic funding to support the process, um, they had the ability to mount a fairly elaborate, what I would call a fairly gold standard process. It involved regional stakeholder groups, it involved science advisory teams, a policy level Blue Ribbon Task Force, all of which were advisory to the California Fish and Game Commission. Then the process ran sequentially through four different regional efforts. It was a complicated, a large-scale process which illustrated many dimensions of collaborative process design and management, so it met our desire to be able to illustrate a full suite of challenges, even though most processes that you all are involved in are probably much less complex. Uh, they hired extremely capable mediators who designed first-rate processes, and because the funders and the law required as much transparency and accountability as possible, all meetings were digitally recorded. So there were hundreds of hours of public meetings available if you were perverse enough to want to watch them. Um, so we had a framework and a case to build a video-based web tool which would illustrate the process of collaborative decision-making. We needed one more thing, which was low-cost labor. And fortunately, we have the great asset of highly capable graduate students, some of whom move on to head marine protected area centers and things like that. But they, at this stage of life at least, they have the energy of youth um, and are not too expensive. So framework plus case study plus graduate student labor sort of equals tool. It was a lot of work, um, but we're proud of what we produced as at least a version 1.0, or I guess it's actually version 2.0, because we went through several rounds of review and revision to get to what is currently on the web. Um, so let's take a look at it. Um, hopefully this will work. So we're moving out to the website.
So it starts with uh, sort of this welcome page um, that uh, opens the site. And you can see here that across the top is uh, what we kind of refer to as a necklace because it has these pearls, which are actually different topics in the website. But I mentioned the four stages uh, that we use as our framework of, uh, and you can see them here, getting started, um, understanding issues, interests, and, and options. There's a range of topics here. Assessing and packaging uh, proposals. Uh, and lastly, uh, reaching agreement. We have a couple of other uh, topic areas that are not so chronological. They sort of extend uh, throughout uh, the site and throughout the process of collaborative decision making. One of which is sort of maintaining control, which includes dealing with the tensions that arise at the table and dealing with potentially disruptive behavior. And we added a piece uh, uh, on tribal considerations. Um, which were particularly uh, rich and, and important in the North Coast process in California. And so there's a series of topics here related to sovereignty, related to traditional ecological knowledge, um, et cetera. So uh, we have an intro section here that uh, covers uh, at a basic level sort of collaborative decision making and provides that, uh, that framework um, and also covers uh, the background on the MLPA uh, initiative. And one thing you can see here uh, immediately is there are multiple ways to navigate through this site. There is the necklace with all the uh, major topic areas. There is on each of the pages of topics, um, there are the set of subtopics underneath. They're all clickable, um, so you can move uh, between uh, topics that way. So these are four different uh, pages related to collaborative decision making. You can also just page uh, uh, continuously through the uh, site using the arrow keys here, and it tells you here where you are. And another thing we added um, is something we call a topic map, which is in fact kind of a site map, but it's better than a site map because it's clickable. Um, you basically can move through these topics uh, uh, pretty easily. There are, in fact, uh, 85 <laughs> topics, so it's a very rich website, most of which have video clips um, associated um, with them. And you can move this around, keep it open um, or not. So um, almost all the uh, pages here uh, click into video clips. And I thought I'd play a few through the webinar um, to give you a taste for what's on here. Um, I apologize, the sound, because we have to play it through the, separately through the speaker, may not be as loud as we'd like, but hopefully you'll be able to hear them. And I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll assess when we go through. So each of the topics have a description of the topic, and then they have a description of the clip itself. And in this one, uh, Caitlin Gaffney, who was then worked for the Ocean Conservancy during the beginning of the MLPA process. I think it's a particularly good clip on simply explaining the difference between a traditional policy process and uh, collaborative decision making. So let's try to take a listen to this. Caitlin Gaffney with Ocean Conservancy. I think that the nature of the public hearing setting where everybody gets their two minutes and lines up and tries to rush through it, it ends up sounding more like a popularity contest. And yet, you know, you pick your thing and you say rah rah for this. Um, and, you know, that's okay, that's part of democracy. But what I loved about my opportunity to participate in the regional stakeholder group is you got past that. You got to look people in the eye, talk to them, try to understand their point of view, and try to come up with solutions it could work for everyone. And that's, that's a much better way to try to solve problems than to line up on two sides of the aisle and raise your hand and cheer and clap. Because what it shows you is that when you really try to work together and meet each other's interests and needs, you can. You come up with creative solutions that you didn't think were possible. It's one thing to sit and talk amongst yourselves and try to figure out what you can live with. And that's, you know, that's good, that's a legitimate thing to do, but it is far better sit down with folks whose views you don't share, try to see it through their eyes, and try to come up with solutions that can meet their needs as well as your own. 
So each of these clips, is, they generally range from, oh, about 30 seconds up to, I think probably the longest ones, maybe four minutes uh, on the site, but they're generally in the sort of minute range. They give you sort of a taste for the topic. They give you a, a clear sense of what was going on, I think, in the MLPA uh, process. So I'm going to keep kind of moving on, uh, share a few other uh, topics, a few other pieces as examples here. So this is the beginning of a stage, the first stage of the process, the getting started process, and we have an introduction to it, and it describes the topics there. Each of the topics themselves then have an introduction, but they also have a set of um, what we call strategies, which are sort of the bullet point summary of takeaways, um, and are often uh, some ideas of particular tools or ideas for a facilitator to use. Um, so this topic, for example, is on the be very beginning of the process where the facilitators, the participants, and others are simply saying who they are and, and uh, what their role is. Uh, so, for example, uh, this is, uh, not, I think I'll play a little bit of this, but this is Scott McCreary, who was one of the lead facilitators for the MLPA process, and he's simply introducing the role of a professional facilitator by describing uh, the function, the sort of the role of his, his firm here, and I'll just play the very beginning of this. And as I introduce this, let me say a little bit about our firm Concur and our practice. We are, uh, as we say, a neutral, nonpartisan facilitation firm specializing in building agreements on natural resource issues. Uh, we come to this work, and, and I in particular come to this work with a background in coastal and marine resources management and environmental policy generally. Um, I think it's important to say that like the other members of the initiative team, we have no particular stake in any particular proposal or outcome. But we do have a very strong stake in making sure that we use the very best information, that we have a robust deliberation, and that we have an effective process. And we would like to arrive at some set of, of stable recommendations or maybe even agreement at the end of the day. So that's the perspective that we bring to this work. Um, sometimes it's the voice, often it's the voice of the facilitators um, talking, but we also capture the voice of the stakeholders here. And sort of another piece I thought I'd, because, because I expect that the audience uh, includes a lot of folks from agencies, one of the really interesting dynamics of simply representation at the table is, you know, who are the agencies and what role they should play and what role they can play. Um, and uh, so I thought I'd play the, a little bit more of this clip that uh, has a few of the stakeholders and they're eight, both an agency representative and one of the uh, non-governmental um, stakeholders kind of talking about what they would like out of the agency. I know there has been some discussion of how um, you want government agency reps to participate in this process, whether as a stakeholder or with the stakeholders. and. So maybe as part of clarifying some of that for some of us, uh, we can also address whether that should be included within the ground rules in some way. I would, I would actually leave it to the agencies. The, the agency staff all have direction from their directors and supervisors as to how they are to engage in this process. If, for instance, you know, Ellen's superiors feel it's important to have their representative voting per se, then that's fine. I mean, we certainly don't have a problem with it. The, the general way that agencies interact on panels such as this is they provide advice, they weigh in as much as they can, but they tend to reserve their quote unquote voting for more formal comments directly agency to agency later in the game, but that doesn't mean that it has to happen that way. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is on the, on the subject of uh, the dilemma of government representatives and their uh, their uh, their role here on, on the panel. And I think that government representatives are really important. And there are two problems that I see with this. One is that there is a culture in government agencies sometimes, but in many government agencies, where folks, particularly those who are not at the top of the food chain, do a lot of listening, but not a lot of talking. And they do that because they're worried about getting in trouble uh, with the folks that they work for. And I think we would all benefit a great deal if we could encourage the government representatives to speak as much as possible, certainly as much as other, 
other folks, but I would like to encourage folks simply to try and distinguish when they're speaking on their own and when they're speaking for the agency. And I think they have an obligation to be clear because if the agency has a position, I want to know what it is as a stakeholder. And I think they should be clear and direct about that. There may be other other many other points though where, where the agency doesn't hasn't expressed a position, but I would like to hear from folks who encourage them to speak. So I'm really I'm personally glad there are a lot of government representatives here. I would encourage those of you to, to please speak out. Um, but it may be just differentiating between when you're speaking as you know an agency representative um, or speaking about agency policy or I guess would be more accurate. Uh, so that's the longest clip I was going to play today. Um, lots of other topics here. Uh, one of the things early on that uh, uh, facilitators, processes need to clarify is sort of the norms of decision making. Uh, uh, often that includes some notion of consensus based uh, decision making. Uh, so I'm going to play just the very beginning of this uh, clip where they're actually talking about the ground rule. In the uh, California MLPA process, Consensus was not the decision rule. Rather, they, they strove for broad-based agreement, but granted no one a veto, basically, by demanding 100% consensus. So here's a piece of a clip where Becky Tudin, who was the facilitator at the time, was going over that, uh, that ground rule. So this was a very interesting discussion that uh, Roberta raised with us. Um, most of you know, I think, in Roberta's background, she also has a lot of facil facilitation experience. So she had um, some concern about the use of the word consensus because in different venues, and in fact in most venues, consensus means everybody will agree to live with this. And that's not exactly what we're going to insist upon here. While we'd like to have that, we're not going to use that as our stop back. So we changed it. We crossed out the word consensus, but in achieve a high level of agreement in developing and advancing alternative proposals. Uh, so um, I think you get a feel for this. Uh, so as we kind of just page over some of these other topics, uh, kind of defining what the difference is between an issue, which is a topic for discussion, and an interest, which is a directional concern uh, by a stakeholder, uh, creating agendas, working groups, uh, brainstorming, inventing options, uh, how you facilitate more productive conversations here. I have a whole section on working with scientific and technical information, which are uh, a unique and important component of most collaborative processes in our realm. Uh, under assessing and packaging, uh, kind of a series of topics uh, about how you start to narrow down uh, what's on the table, uh, packaging uh, proposals, uh, whole set of uh, topics around assessing preferences, which brings in the topics of sort of straw polling. Uh, and kind of taking binding votes or non-binding votes, generally non-binding votes if, uh, would be preferred um, here. Uh, reaching agreements, topics about how you close it down and it brings back this topic of consensus and how do we actually make uh, choices at the end of a process. Maintaining control, about managing tensions, managing disrupt potentially disruptive uh, behavior. Uh, and I thought I'd actually play a little bit of a clip about uh, uh, how, where you see the facilitator, Scott McCreary, actually try to intervene to control what becomes a violation of the ground rule in terms of uh, personal attack uh, of, uh, on it, one of the stakeholders. Um, and to do some of the scientific analysis, what I propose, it might be better to go the other way and just have one big one, and I look forward to hearing from the, the scientists on that too. Yeah, the related question is, uh, and this might be answered by some fishermen here, would that close spacing with the gaps for fishing, even though it's a fairly lightly area, used area, as I understand it, would that set up a dynamic of perhaps displaced effort affecting the, the non-reserve areas? All you left us was basically sand. <laughs> you took all our best fishing spots. You must have went to fishing game and got all blocked our fish tickets and said, wow, okay, they make most of their money there, they make most of their money there, they make most of their money there, so we're going to take all those and we're going to leave the sand. Now, this would put us out of business. Um, I, don't Tom, I, I don't think that's how Caitlin went about assembling. I, I don't know. I, I presentation. I, would, I wouldn't impugn her motives in that way. 
Well, I've been I've been dealing with her for the last ten years. She's been trying to put us out of business for the last ten years. Tom, you're right on the line. Stop. Okay, I'm just Wait. telling you what's going on here. It, it was really fun, by the way, re reviewing these uh, hundreds of hours of meetings because there's lots of drama. Um, there's lots of uh, interesting people that you meet through the process. Um, the other piece here is, is the tribal considerations, which is something that you, people usually are kind of really interested in. Uh, and I, th I think it'll be the last clip I, I, I play here. But clearly the involvement of tribes, the involvement of tribal members create um, unique challenges for a collaborative process. And so we have a segment uh, talking about uh, tribal sovereignty and sort of explaining that from the perspective of a tri tribal member, also tech, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, so here is a piece here somewhere. Yeah, um, here's a piece of a of a clip where a tribal member is explaining her perspective on tribal sovereignty. Trinidad and Grand Sharia Tribal Council will review and provide formal comments on the information received today. We do support the dissemination of the inter-tribal CQ Wilderness Council document and. Um, Hopefully that gives you sort of a quick taste, uh, an appetizer perhaps, uh, that you would want to dig into this site on your own. And it is open access. There's no registration process. Uh, we, our every interest is in helping to uh, get a lot of this material out into use for those that would find it helpful. Um, there is an, uh, at the beginning of the site, there is a user guide, a PDF user guide that talks, that kind of describes the functionality of the site and gives some illustrations of how it can be used. Uh, there's a glossary and there's pop-up uh, definitions of words uh, throughout the site. Um, and then again, there is this topic map uh, that you can uh, pretty easily navigate, uh, see number one, what the topics are and then navigate to them. Um, so I'm gonna open up in a, in a minute or two to questions and comments, but I guess I want to note that from our perspective, there are a variety of ways to use the site. Um, in, a, in a teaching context, um, so we, we teach a 20-hour intensive uh, mediation course for uh, our graduate students. And what we do for the students is ask them before taking the course, and this is after they've taken our negotiation course, but before taking the mediation course, we ask them to work their way through the site. Um, and kind of they uh, get a deeper sense of the framework and you see sort of actual facil facilitators um, doing some of the things that we've sort of uh, talked about conceptually. And then we're able to refer to specific clips and to specific topics during the course. And students find that a very kind of helpful uh, process. Uh, it also has led to conversations about the style of different facilitators and you know, Scott McCreary and Eric Pontelet and some of the other facilitators that are profiled here have different styles, so that's kind of helpful as well. Um, in a class setting, an instructor could point students to a particular topic and then engage them in a uh, discussion about, uh, you know, given uh, this uh, topic or this kind of situation here, uh, how might you uh, 
what, how might you strategically respond to it, and then actually run the video clip. And one of the things we did on the topic map is to add numbers uh, throughout so that uh, basically an instructor or an inter interactive content uh, 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 situation could refer them easily to a clip number rather than uh, something else. So obviously, it's a pretty com complex site. There's a lot of uh, material here. There's probably about three to four hours of video content uh, in 85 different segments. And we are working to sort of create different pathways based on uh, different kinds of problems or situations that uh, you all face, which then require either more or less elaborate processes and different pathways based on a user's experience. Uh, you know, some individuals have lots of experience and background and some are very limited. So we want to try to find different ways through so that uh, both can, can get useful material out of it. I, I would say that I had originally expected this site to be l largely useful to people with fairly limited background in uh, facilitation or even in collaborative process. But one of, one of my colleagues, who's a senior mediator with decades of experience, he reviewed the site for us. Um, and he made this interesting comment that he never sees other senior mediators at work, basically because agencies can't afford two of them in, in, in one place. So, and he found it really useful to see others practice. And so they are uh, actually using it as a set of training opportunities uh, in his firm. So, uh, I want to open it up now for uh, questions and comments. Uh, and I would say that we're very interested in your thoughts about how we can make this tool more useful to people like yourselves, and also to see whether there are individuals or groups that uh, you could imagine finding the site helpful that we, we would want to be sure uh, to reach out to. And my email uh, is up here, as is the site uh, URL, uh, and I'd be interested in feedback in whatever form uh, that you're able to provide. So thanks for listening, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, the floor is open. Okay, thank you, Steve. And I, I see there are a couple of questions that we're asking for the URL to be put back up, so thanks for doing that. And hopefully people can can go check out the URL right now. Uh, there were a couple of people who, who asked, and one person who said that they, they couldn't find it. So uh, I encourage you all to, to go ahead and check it out now while we're on the phone, and if you have questions, please go ahead and, and ask those. So there are a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, one from Rick Simpson, who is asking about the Okanga British Columbia experience uh, that he has been part of, and and asking about how social network analysis might fit into collaborative processes. Yeah, that's an interesting question. The uh, the only way I've seen formal social network analysis kind of incorporated in is in the usually. Uh, uh, facilitators do a conflict assessment before they ever engage in a process and I have seen people map uh, using uh, kind of network analysis uh, computer tools actually map the networks of groups and stakeholders as one way to identify clusters of stakeholders to then think about representation which is obviously a question here how do you figure out who should sit around the table and who should represent whom so I've seen it done in that way um, I could see it being done potentially interactively with a group early on, but uh, I, I'm less confident about that. And there are a couple of questions about the tool itself. One asking if there are transcripts of the videos that are available, and also the potential to, to provide translation of some of the videos into other languages. Well, that's a great question. Um, there are no transcripts. Uh, the you, the amazing thing about the California MLPA process is that everything that ever uh, appeared on that process, documents, uh, videos of meeting, um, all kinds of things are still on the, on the California Fish and Wildlife Agency's website, and it's a really rich site, and you can access it. But there are no transcripts. We basically uh, transcribe sections of this, and I'm, I am working on a book length a narrative story about the California MLPA process starting from when the science was developing in the 80s to the law in California in the 90s to the failure by the agencies to actually try to implement it first and the development of the philanthropic initiative and then through the four regional processes. Um, 
and into implementation. And I'm actually almost to the implementation part, so we're talking about a year out from that when this would be done. But in that process, I've uh, sort of manually done transcripts um, of uh, pieces of the meetings, but th there are, there are I, I said hundreds of hours, I think there's probably in the thousands of hours of material. So no, there's no transcripts. Um, I think it's, that's an interesting question. I guess we'd be interested in finding out where, how people would imagine uh, a non-English speaking audience, audience accessing this, because I could see us potentially um, putting some translations. Um, I don't know if we'd want to dub them into the audio. That seems like a lot of effort, but running a, a, a written translation under some of them, but it would take a fair bit of effort. So I'd be curious to, to find out the sort of the idea, the germ of the idea there about how this would get used in within other audiences. Well, I can just tell you from my own perspective, uh, we assist with capacity building in other countries. And as soon as I saw this tool, I thought it could be really useful as part of those trainings, kind of in the way you described, Steve, of, of honing in on a particular issue and playing the video clip and, and holding a discussion about it. Mm -hmm. And do you see the language as a as an issue there, or it would definitely benefit. Yeah, it would definitely benefit, and it might be possible to build in uh, some translation through um, you know targeted trainings that are being supported in other countries if they had an interest in this. Mm -hmm. And someone else who who raised the question originally said her the context of her question was working with the International Commission on Great Lakes and providing being required to provide uh, materials in French and English. Right. Yeah. So another question that I have is, do you see this tool as done, or do you view it as uh, iterative, that it will continue to grow over time? Um, well, this, we have a, a, a long list of uh, to other topics we'd like to add in, other uh, capabilities. We saw it in a teaching frame of potentially uh, sort of sequencing it and in a way that actually uh, poses questions to um, users that a, an instructor could kind of control the, the response and you talk about the response and then you, you sort of run the clip or, or provide the response. Um, so no, this, we don't see this as done um, and in fact part of the idea of, of the webinar was to try to solicit more feedback on this. Um, you know, how much we develop, but we were fortunate. We had funding from uh, actually a former student has a family foundation, the McCants Family Foundation, that uh, funded uh, some of this, and Resources Legacy Fund Foundation that served as the conduit for the funding in California for the MLPA is funding much of my work on the book on, on the California MLPA process. Um, so we were fortunate to have that funding. Um, whether we'll be equally fortunate to get other funding to support graduate students uh, to do some of this, I'm, I'm not as clear. Uh, so I would, uh, part of this is to assess, uh, you know, how interested people are and particularly in incorporating other functionality. Um, and that would tend to motivate us to follow up on it. Yeah. There's been a question asking about this, the, the recorded session of this talk, and yes, it will be posted and it will be on open channels. So if anyone you know missed it or wants to take a look at it, um, we will have it there. And uh, I've got another question, but I encourage you all to continue sending in any questions or observations that you have. Um, there's a question asking, uh, or rather commenting, that Traditional knowledge is important, but so is local ecological knowledge. So I think the, the speaker is distinguishing between uh, indigenous knowledge and also local knowledge. Yeah, that's a good point. And that certainly came up in this, this process as well, absolutely. And, we, and I don't think we really have addressed that in the site in any place, and we might want to uh, clarify that. So another comment from Christine Prince saying this seems like a rich, well-developed, and well-referenced tool, and have you thought of developing it into a certification? Uh, can we get, uh, I don't know the answer to that. I'd like to learn what kind of certification it could be used for um, and how we would do that. I mean, so can we, can we get Christine to? Yeah, absolutely. We can, we can put you in touch uh, with the email list. I can mention that. Uh, you know, there are MPA programs like the Park Service that uh, has certain certifications for skills 
And then, of course, uh, University of Rhode Island has an MPA training and other types of capacity building where they have certifications. So there might be some linkages there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'd certainly be interested because I assume that then services an incentive to people to uh, spend the time working through the material. And it also probably uh, says something about the quality of materials used in certified programs. So yeah, I'd like to learn more about that. Yeah, there's also the um, National Conservation Training Center that the Fish and Wildlife Service runs. And they run a right. variety of courses. And I could see this being great course material for some of their work as well. Um, so I think part of it is, is maybe just uh, reaching out to some of these partners and seeing uh, where it might fit in. For example, there, there may be segments that are particularly suited to a particular course, not the whole thing. Right. Yeah, and one of the things we've been trying to figure out is how we help potential instructors access pieces of the site, mm -hmm. uh, because it, it, it can be overwhelming. It's, uh, there's so many topics in here that it, uh, it's sort of hard to figure out, I think. So we've been trying to uh, uh, figure that out. I, I have taught at the NCTC week-long courses uh, on collaborative resource management, and I, you know, at that time, I was sorry we didn't have uh, more video content uh, of actual clips. A lot of the video content, the Harvard Program on Negotiation does have videos on uh, kind of negotiators. They may, the, the topic areas may differ from what your audience uh, might be interested in, but but they're they're generally not. You're, you're not actually seeing people do it. Um, and I think that traditionally you didn't either record or, uh, or video record uh, processes because of concern about confidentiality and concern about um, uh, people not speaking because they were being recorded. Um, so I think we were very fortunate actually in this California process that it sort of had to be set up that way and they wanted to set it up that way. And, and all I can tell is that while people may be aware of these cameras in, in the MLPA context, they look like, I don't know, they look like R2-D2 or the, some kind of robot in the middle of the room that was pretty noticeable when you were first there. But it appears that people sort of forgot about them and they, it, it was not a barrier to their behaviors. Um, so I, I think we ended up with a lot of fairly rich material, but it, it's, it, from, from all I can tell is it's fairly unusual to be able to access that. And I would just note that we have a couple of comments from Andrea Carson, who I, I think may be from NCTC, and she says they are offering a course on multi-party collaboration and conflict resolution and that she would be very happy to follow up and see how instructors could access and use this resource. Super. That'd be great, and I'd be happy to talk with her about it. Yeah, so I wanted to follow up with you about the people kind of forgetting about the camera. Uh, did people sign a waiver, you know, al allowing uh, the use of this information, or was that a kind of a condition of the public process? I think it was a condition of the public process. I don't think they they signed waivers. Um, so I, I don't believe they signed waivers. I won't say that abs with absolute certainty. They, though, at the beginning of every meeting, reminded people that they were being recorded. Uh, part of this was also to stream uh, to other uh, uh, dispersed sites that the meeting content so it wasn't just to record it but it was also so that they had uh, people across California who could watch things mm -hmm. and they had so many moving parts so many people in this uh, fairly high level people scientists etc that they wanted them to be able to uh, view this and uh, uh, you know even if they weren't able to attend the meetings so I don't think they signed waivers I think it made it quite clear that it was a public meeting and all the public meeting records were open and could be uh, used by someone and people should be aware of that. It's funny, I see them also saying, you know, that we're recording this also for posterity. And I, as I've been watching these meetings, I'm thinking people are thinking, yeah, right, who's going to watch these down the line? <laughs> and yet, I, here I, we are. Uh, yeah, and here we are, yeah. Uh, so I wanted to pass on a message from uh, Trina ba Baird who says, the tool is very relevant and timely for our, this is Audubon's, work in Washington State. We, along with our state and federal partners, are at the beginning stages of pursuing this type of approach to work with private landowners to enhance connectivity in the sagebrush step. We feel like this is the right approach, but none of us have ever done it before, so this tool will be extremely helpful. And she also Great. mentions, she mentions the landscape conservation cooperatives which are uh, under, under the umbrella of the Fish and Wildlife Service, but run with a variety of federal programs, would be a good place to disseminate this work. 
Yeah, and you know, one of the things, that, you know, my initial, uh, because of our focus and kind of training facilitators uh, out of this, I originally thought the site was probably most helpful for ac people who would actually facilitate. But I think that it's also really potentially helpful for if uh, an agency or an NGO like Audubon is, is thinking about sort of introducing a collaborative approach, of potentially suggesting to the stakeholders to here, take a look at this, and you can get a, get a feel. Um, for how these processes work and, and what some of the issues are. The, the only proviso or concern I have about this site is it makes it seem pretty overwhelming uh, it, you know, because the MLPA process was uh, long and complex and fairly intensive and not all collaboratives need to be that way at all. Uh, so I think the point that you always want to emphasize with people is you want to get the benefits of the collaborative in terms of face-to-face -face engagement and shared learning and sort of creativity and problem solving and the notion of, you know, trying to look for joint gains, et cetera. But it doesn't have to come in a multi-year uh, process with, with four different structures uh, going simultaneously. Um, so that, that would be the message I would, uh, I would suggest. And the, the other is, uh, you know, the MLPA process was, uh, was responding to the, the specific legal mandate to produce a plan that would then be designated by the California Fish and Game Commission, that a lot of collaborative engagement can start with something much smaller in terms of pilot efforts to work together. And my experience has been that those sort of baby steps or those sort of low-hanging fruit can often lead to building relationships and understanding that enables you to actually engage more deeply in, in more conflict-laden situations. And I, and I would refer to this book that Julia and I have coming out. We do profile uh, 10 case studies of uh, ecosystem scale, kind of marine ecosystems uh, around North America uh, that uh, some of them are really, really longstanding kinds of processes. Some of them are shorter, some of them are top down, some of them are sort of bottom up. But they do talk about, uh, they provide a structure for understanding what seems to have made them work. Um, and again, it's those facets of what makes them work that's important, not the complexity of, of a process. So two comments I wanted to make. One is that I think the site is extremely well organized so that even though it's very dense, it's very logical and I think the, the different kinds of navigation really help once you start to move around in it. And the second comment I wanted to make is that one that we've heard a lot about the California process is that it is the gold standard, but not everybody has that much gold. And so then, then where do you go? And I think you make a good comment, Steve, that you know, you don't have to do things at this level for it to be still useful. And it might be something to build into the site if it's not there already, is this idea of how can we apply these lessons? I mean, I know it's implied everywhere, but how can we apply this in cases where it's not as well resourced? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think we probably need to, we, we say that up front and we provide a couple other examples, but I think one of the things we're trying to figure out is how do we uh, sort of create much uh, shorter pathways through the material that kind of say that in a, in a much less complicated situation, maybe these are the key topics. Um, I don't know that we fully uh, have, have reached that yet, but I think that's an important message. So I wanted to pass on a, another comment from someone who was a former member of the North Coast Regional Stakeholder Group, and he says that stakeholders for this round were interviewed by the facilitators before being selected. This was an effort to develop and avoid a more uh, collaborative versus combative environment. And I, I think that's a really interesting point for uh, those who are starting out in a process like this. Yeah, and, and generally most uh, facilitation firms or mediators would uh, say that, that we require that. Um, and in the MLPA process, that was done in the, in the last three regions. It wasn't done in the first region. The first region, which was the Central Coast process around Monterey, Santa Cruz, et cetera, uh, was started by the state, and then they sort of brought in the facilitators. Uh, but the other ones were done after that, and the facilitators interviewed all the stakeholders. I think they actually interviewed all the potential, the nominated stakeholders, and part of that was to do a conflict assessment, that is to understand the situation, and hence how they should structure a process and ground rules, et cetera. But it was also a way to, uh, to wean, to, to identify stakeholder representatives that they thought would be good in terms of their knowledge, but also in terms of their ability to act in a sort of collaborative fashion. 
Uh, it's it's a normal uh, step in a in a well facilitated professionally facilitated process. Uh, and then, as the North Coast person probably knows, is they usually I think in the first meeting of each of those regions, the facilitators presented their what they observe from their their stakeholder interviews to the stakeholders as a starting point of a conversation. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a good idea and, a, and an important one, and it doesn't have to be as 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 complex as was done in MLPA, but it's important to get a pretty good sense up front of what the issues are, you know, what level of science is involved, how you then design an effective process, who needs to be at the table given those issues, given the diversity of representation, and then you create a process accordingly. You don't just start. Uh, you try to do it as strategically and planfully as you can. I think you do that no matter how complex the process. We have a question from Nadel Flynn who is asking, how critical is it to have professional facilitators in this process and how do you know if this can be internally facilitated or when you need to reach out to professionals? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think that the part of the issue comes in, in the level of conflict uh, among the parties. Um, part of it comes in the sort of the reputation and um, kind of image of the agency that would be facilitating this. Um, you know, sometimes they're not trusted and so it probably makes sense to get somebody who is uh, more than apparently neutral is actually hired for their nonpartisan stance. But other times, and I think in general, the field has, has gone that uh, more agencies are developing either sort of circuit riders who can play this as a quasi non, uh, nonpartisan uh, role or they're simply incorporating better process skills in planning staff, et cetera. And for many planning processes, that may be just fine. Uh, I would say that you, you do want, if you can, to not uh, put the role of both facilitator and stakeholder on the same person. So if an agency is facilitating process, it, I think it's usually better to have somebody who's, whose job is facilitating and then somebody who's to representing the agency's perspective into the process and it's not co-resident in the same individual. It's just really hard to sort of play that out. Uh, but I think it all comes back to the nature of the, of the conflict and, and certainly whether you have resources or not and whether uh, the parties believe that the agency can sort of play a, a, a fair role. We have a question from Jim Hain who, who is commenting that uh, he's involved in recovery and implementation plans for endangered species, including right whales. And, and of course, we had the earlier comment about someone involved in the sagebrush step. And the, the question is, could you see um, other dimensions that might need to be added to the tool uh, that to address other kinds of resource public processes? Well, there's all the, I mean, it's, all of these have their own context in terms of the science, um, the legal basis, um, what, if there are fundamental values at stake. Um, and so they, they, so all, all conflicts or situations have, have their context and the process needs to respond to that. I think in general, the framework, the structure that we provide is pretty reasonable through most, uh, you know, independent of context. Um, but uh, so, uh, but I, I think if we were going to use this tool, for example, to introduce people to recovery planning, um, I think you definitely want to have as a component the, what the ESA requires and the kind of regulatory structure of that and the timing of that, et cetera. But I think that it, what we have in this tool is it points to the need to clarify those things as legal and scientific sideboards. So, so I think the framework works, uh, but I think part of it is that the framework points you to, in fact, taking, advantage, taking account of those things. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. I think this was really a great introduction to this tool, and I can see a lot of different applications for it. It sounds like there's a lot of interest from the, from the audience, so we'll make sure that you get that email list so you can follow up with some folks, and we will post the recording of the webinar on the Open Channels website, and I want to thank everybody for participating, and thanks again, Steve. Excellent. Thanks.